We begin in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord, Jesus Christ. The Christian life is not an experience. Salvation is an experience. The Christian life is a journey. It's a path we walk. It's choices we make with God's guidance and strength. Paul speaks of it as a race. A race that we run for a prize. Running as if to win. You know, it's too easy when we think of our Christianity to look back and say, yes, I remember the time I was on the altar. Some people have a date and an hour. I accepted the Lord as my Savior. But that is not what makes you a Christian. Now, yes, you need salvation to be a Christian. But life is a journey and Christianity is a voyage, not a one-moment experience. Life is filled, all of life, with crossroads, forks in the road, decisions that we need to make, periods in which God gives us an opportunity to choose Him or the world, to move forward in our relationship or to walk away. Life is filled with these experiences. Life is made or broken at the forks of decision. Genesis chapter 22. I want to prep you as you're turning with what has gone on in the Abraham story so far. In chapter 12, before Abraham even really knew who God was, because before he had ever gone anywhere, God came to him and he promised him, Abraham, I will make you a great nation, and you will be a blessing. Whoever curses you will be cursed, whoever blesses you will be blessed, and all nations on earth will be blessed through you. A promise before Abraham had ever done anything. God promised him that. Abraham obeyed God and went to the land that he was, he was told to go to. Then, three chapters later, in chapter 15, God tells him he's going to have a son. Now, Abraham's like 90 years old. You know, he's old. And his wife is older than that, and she's been barren her whole life. And God says he's going to have a son. You know, the first, Abraham's first response, he laughs. But he doesn't doubt God, and he believes him. And because he believes what God says, it says in Scripture, God credited it to him as righteousness. And at that moment, God renews the covenant with Abraham because he believed in him. And once again, he promises what he promised in chapter 12. Now, why does he promise it again if he's already promised it? Hold that thought as we move to Genesis chapter 22. We're going to read verses 9 through 12 and verses 15 to 18. Genesis 22, beginning in verse 9. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. God had told him to do this, by the way. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out, from, out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Moving on to verse 15. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Now, is it just me, or does it sound like Abraham's blessing is based on what Abraham did in Genesis chapter 22? But how can that be? God had already made that promise in chapter 12. He renewed it in chapter 15. He renewed it again in chapter 17. Why does he make it sound like that whole experience hinged on Abraham's willingness to sacrifice Isaac? He made the promise at least three times, and if you read the story, you'll see a fourth. 
And now he's acting as though the promise was based on this. Why? How does that make sense? Was the promise not true the first time? Was it not true the second, the third? Why does God put it this way? Now, Abraham is an example of someone who chooses right in situations like the sacrifice of Isaac, crisis situations, crossroads of faith. Before we really begin to dig into what God's doing here, let's look at an example of a man who did not make the choices Abraham made. It's in Scripture. If you turn to 1 Samuel chapter 13, as I'm prefacing the story of Saul, 1 Samuel chapter 13, we're going to begin in verse 7. I want you to know something about Saul before we get to these next verses. Because like I've given you two crossroads in Abraham's life, in which Abraham made the right choice, Saul also gets two chances, two crisis situations. Saul will not come out quite as good as Abraham. But I do want you to see what the Bible says about Saul before he comes to these crisis situations. This is not 1 Samuel 13. I'm going to quote this before we get there, so don't go nuts trying to find it. The Bible says, As Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart. And all this is when Samuel blesses Saul. He anoints him as king. As Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart. And all these signs were fulfilled that day. When they arrived at Gibeah, a procession of prophets met him. The Spirit of God came upon him in power, and he joined in their prophesying. God changed Saul's heart, and he sent the Holy Spirit to Saul in power. King Saul, he is spirit-filled, and he has a changed heart. Now watch what happens in his crisis situations. 1 Samuel chapter 13. It's actually 7b. Begin at the beginning of the paragraph. Saul remained at Gilgal, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men, men began to scatter. He's getting ready to attack the enemy, but they need to make a sacrifice to the Lord before they go or else God's blessing won't be on them. And he's waiting for the prophet Samuel to come and make the sacrifice. And his men are starting to freak out. They're running. They're getting afraid. They don't see Samuel coming. And Saul begins to panic. Crisis situation, I think. So, this is verse 9. So he said, Bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived. And Saul went out to greet him. What have you done, asked Samuel? Saul replied, When I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, Now the Philistines come down against me at Gilgal and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. You acted foolishly, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people, because you have not kept the Lord's command. Crisis situation one for Saul, he didn't come out too good. And because of this, he will lose everything. His kingdom, his crown, and his very sanity later. So, would we agree that it sounds like God has already taken his throne from him? Sounds like it, doesn't it? Now, turn with me two chapters. 1 Samuel chapter 15. 15, beginning in verse 12. Saul, actually, I should probably start earlier. I'm sorry. Let's begin in verse 10. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I am grieved that I've made Saul king, because he has, he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was troubled, and he cried out to the Lord all night. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he was told, Saul has gone to Carmel. There he has set up a monument to his own honor and has turned and gone down to Gilgal. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, The Lord bless you. I've carried out the Lord's instructions. See, Saul was instructed by the Lord to kill all the Amalekites, who were pagan peoples, who were attacking God's people. Saul had been commanded to kill every one of them, men, women, and children. 
sheep and livestock, everything that belongs to the Amalekites, smite them out. And, and Saul is coming to Samuel saying, I did it. I followed the Lord's word. But Samuel said, verse 14, What then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? Saul answered, The soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God. But we totally destroyed the rest. Stop, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Tell me, Saul replied. Samuel said, Although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and he sent you on a mission, saying, Go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Make war on them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on a mission on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag, their king. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Twice God rejects him as king. Why twice? Wasn't he rejected the first time? Why is Samuel shocked when God says, I'm grieved that I made Saul king? Because he's already rejected Saul as king. Well, I think we need to put together the Abraham story and the Saul story to understand what is going on. Abraham was promised three or four times that he would be a blessing. Saul was rejected as king twice. What is the only commonality between them? They each hit crisis experiences in their lives, and they made very varying choices. And the choice that they made there did not necessarily determine where they would be in the future. Because it's clear that if Saul had obeyed God's will to destroy the Amalekites, he might have been sustained as king. If he had obeyed in the first place and not did the sacrifice, he might have remained as king. If Abraham had not believed that God would give him a son, he might not have been blessed. If Abraham had not evidenced his faith in God through the willingness to sacrifice his own son, he might not have been blessed. Why can I say this? Because Scripture clearly seems to indicate that the very state of God's promises are based not on one experience, but on how we react to the crisis experience in our present. Not the ones in our past, but in our present. Life is a journey filled with moments of crisis. Our decisions at those moments are critical. Unless Scripture is deceiving us, it seems as though God gives us in these moments an opportunity to reaffirm our faith or to walk away. I know it's not easy. And we will get to hope. But you need to understand the reality of our experience. God promises you things that will keep you strong. And he promises faithfulness to you. And he promises that nothing, Satan can't take you away, height nor depth, principalities or powers, nothing on earth can separate you from that love. But you'll see strangely absent in every one of those verses. He never says you can't walk away. Never once. First Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 24. This is Paul the Apostle writing. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. 
Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Paul lived with that fear. Perseverance is the call sign of Christianity. The longer we're here, the longer the battle rages. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 32. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light, when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. You ready for the hope? Romans chapter 7, verse 21. You can turn if you want to, but I want you to listen. Listen to what is here. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself, in my mind, am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Therefore, or but... There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, and that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so He condemned sin and sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. The first verse we read, be filled with the Spirit. It's a command in Scripture. You need the Spirit of God, and He will carry you, and He will give you strength in those crisis moments of your life to turn and do the right thing. But only He can do it, and you need to put yourself in a position to receive that power. It comes through devotions in the morning, even when we don't think we need it because things are good. It powers you. It drives you to Christ. It teaches you who He is. It shows you what He wants. It makes you aware of the promises that He's given to you so you can claim them when sin comes. Prayer. It's so important to open our hearts to God. Prayer opens us to the Almighty so that in times of crisis, the Almighty can reach inside of us and show us what the right thing is. In Greek, Paul literally says, be continuously filled with the Holy Spirit. It means it needs to be an ongoing action in the present. Be continually filled. Start putting yourself in a position to receive His Spirit. Prayer, devotions, church, anywhere you can to feed off the Holy Spirit and the power that God's given to you. There is security. Absolutely. But you have to remember, in Christ alone, we put our trust. And in Christ alone will we glory. Because He is the answer. And if you let Him in, you will never have to fear death. Never. It's in your hand.